one. Um, but welcome. Well, thank you. Yeah, thanks for coming in. Yeah, thank you for inviting me. Yeah, this has been a great experience to come during this very interesting time, so. It is a very, very interesting time. Yeah. <laughs> to oh, say the least. Now it's beginning. Should we start over? Okay. <laughs> Tell us when. Okay. Take two. Um, I believe we had a sound malfunction. So, again, welcome to <clears throat> be two ferns between two people with Yoga Factory of Pittsburgh. Kidding. Uh, Yoga Talks from Yoga Factory Online. And I'm Zeb. This is Dr. Tyler Fan. Um, so again, welcome. Thank you very much, Zeb. Yeah. Let's try that again. So you have a bunch of different titles and accomplishments, but one of the things that you do right now in Pittsburgh is you're the, the owner and the runner of Source Pittsburgh. Yeah, I'm the owner of Source Pittsburgh. Um, I also run um, an interesting, <laughs> my son is back there. He's giving you the he thumbs up. up. Yeah, is, um, I'm also the executive director of the Goldman Institute for Social Research, which is a um, nonpartisan think tank where we research kind of issues and um, society and culture, but kind of deal with them in more innovative ways. Mm -hmm. So, um, and one of the big initiatives that we have now is called Critical Dharma. So, uh, before Critical Dharma was this kind of gathering where we would have discussions on issue um, society and culture, utilizing some aspects of contemplative science and kind of um, Trauma, with trauma-informed care, mm -hmm. but now it's going to be hitting online um, this week, this Thursday. So we're going to be, um, first book we're going to research is The Plague, which is a novel by um, Albert Camus. And um, after that, we're going to kind of go dive into what is now called Buddhist modernism. So, but yeah, one of the things um, I research is yoga and meditation. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm a medical anthropologist, so looking at it from a medical perspective, but also the social historical context mm -hmm. of yoga and meditation, um, and kind of bring in these ideas and practices in the limelight through their sometimes controversial histories. So um, that's kind of what we look at and um, examine how we can deal with issues utilizing some of these practices, some of these methods, yeah, but also ideas and try to like, I guess the thing is, there's usually this connotation that is some kind of Eastern mystical thought. Yeah, like it's magic. Yeah, it's like it's magic. But mm -hmm. um, if you're getting into any of these ideas, like let's let's say Buddhism and the many different ideas of Buddhism, you have this really non-mystical, very logical approach on the nature of existence. Mm -hmm. Right. So those are like really kind of hard pressing ideas and have been adapted into like existential philosophy, even in logical analytical philosophy. Now, there's this philosopher named Graham Priest, who's really into what is called um, paraconsistent logic um, with this idea of tetralemma. It's a lot to explain. I'm not going to bore you all out with that, but um, <laughs> he's one of the foremost logicians right now. Mm -hmm. Um, and he's adopted this idea of tetralemma, which is from the first century Buddhist philosophers Interesting. in examining existence. Yeah. yeah. There's a lot of interplay between Buddhism and yoga philosophy, Vedic totally. philosophy as well. Yeah. Um, the, the East was sort of a melting pot right around the switchover from BC to BCE. Sure. And there's a lot of um, common philosophy between a lot of those different schools of thought. Yeah, and, and that's the thing. There's a lot of commonality and there's a lot of these like tensions as well, sure. right? So, I mean, in 
the typical what we call Buddhology thought, so is this or Buddhist study thought. Mm -hmm. Even in the Mahayana context, philosophically, there's these two debates about um, either the Yogacara school, which were more centered on jitta or the mind, mm -hmm. consciousness, or the uh, Madhyamaka school, which is the middle way school, which actually um, critiqued the substantive nature, so it's like essence or substance, substantive nature of existence, saying that all things are empty, essentially. Mm -hmm. You know, so that's like a big tension and by allegedly by the second century, things were kind of melted to together by the Prasingaka movements. But um, yeah, those kind of philosophies, especially with the Yamakas, um, are adopted now or in the past 30 years in what we call deconstruction mm -hmm. or postmodern thought or post-structuralism, right? Sure. So critiquing meaning, critiquing like any form of structural existence. You know? Yeah. So that's been argued since the first century, allegedly. Yeah. So not to get too, too philosophical. Yeah. Um, so I was reading in your bio that you started Source Pittsburgh when, in 2010, yeah. originally. And then you took a bit of a hiatus yeah. to kind of continue your studies. So you have an MA in Buddhist studies? Yeah, so the MA is, well, it was MA in religion. It's from the School of Oriental and African Studies, which in America, people don't know what SOAS is. <laughs> but in England, if you're like, oh, yeah, I went to SOAS, they're like, oh, wow, it's a very, very specialized university. Mm -hmm. um, it's chartered by the Queen. It's part of the University of London. And it only focuses on Asia, Africa, and the Middle East. Mm -hmm. So you have a whole school that has no natural sciences at all. Yeah. And only focus, just focused on them. Just focused on the cultural and social components. So that's really some, some intensive study. Yeah. 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 And then you have your PhD also in anthropology. Yeah. So I have my PhD in anthropology from University College London, which mm -hmm. is the university that Gandhi got his law degree or where Christopher Nolan got his degree and where Coldplay met together. Um, nice. So it's the biggest research university in London. Um, there's a lot of resources and that's kind of why I chose it. Mm -hmm. um, and originally I was researching Helicobacter pylori in Bhutan, which is the bacteria that causes peptic ulcers mm -hmm. in people um, in Bhutan. So that's what my primary research, but then after that, I started researching Chinese medicine in the United States. Okay. The theme of like regulations and how that kind of shifted. But there's a whole like racial component to it. Sure. You know, so. so with a doctoral thesis these days, you have to get very, very specific. Yeah. 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 So my um, primary in my thesis dealt with the structures of power when it comes to Chinese medicine in the United States. Mm -hmm. And what I argue is that um, the structure of powers came from all the way from 1882 with the Chinese Exclusion Act, mm -hmm. where um, Chinese practitioners could not practice Chinese medicine under the, under the guise of like a physician. Mm -hmm. They had to be designated as a merchant. So because at the time of the um, Chinese Exclusion Act, anyone who was not a merchant were deported. Mm -hmm. So just think about this, 1882 to 1943, um, Chinese Americans were not considered citizens in this country. So um, after that was lifted, you also have this unique tension with um, Asian Americans in the Japanese internment camps, right? right. So in just t 10 years after that, you see like Jack Kerouac and the Beats writing about Dharma bums while traveling throughout the whole landscape of these internment camps, briefly mentioning, if any at all. Mm -hmm. But um, my big focus in that research was that in the 70s, um, some primarily white American acupuncturists utilized the acupuncture needle to create regulations. And the first regulation was AB 1500 in California, so Assembly Bill 1500 mm -hmm. in California, which basically marginalized any Asian American from practicing acupuncture in the United States. So Caucasians still could. Yeah, they could. Uh, well, they could under the auspices of a university, which actually behooved only 
only six of these um, cohort members um, that were part of UCLA. So they were basically trying to kind of take away, like steal for their own yeah, entire Yeah, balance. yeah, and yeah. it was finally lifted under um, Governor um, Jerry Brown, mm -hmm. became governor again. Okay, um, yeah. Yeah, that Jerry Brown. Um, he lifted it in 1975 or 1976, um, and it was overturned. Mm -hmm. uh, but that was actually the first legislation that was ever created, and that specifically, um, so basically from the oldest records of 1910 mm -hmm. to 1976 or 1972, there were only like six people ever arrested for practicing medicine without a license, which is practicing acupuncture yeah. without a medical license. But from 1972 to 1973, 60 cases of arrest happened mm -hmm. just in one year alone. Right. So, and all of them were Asian American. Sure. So this yeah. is a unique kind of history that even kind of trickles into today's regulations mm -hmm. um, and the structure of how Chinese medicine is. And so you are, we, we may not have mentioned this earlier, but you also are a certified acupuncturist. Yeah, I'm a licensed acupuncturist, so mm -hmm. that requires four years of education, mm -hmm. mandatory. Um, and yeah, basically my di dissertation kind of debunked the necessity for that many years of education, <laughs> um, stating the counter example, which is England, mm -hmm. that has no regulations at all for acupuncture. Interesting. Yeah. So, um, yeah, is this really unique tension? And uh, that kind of got me to these two projects that I'm working on right now, mm -hmm. which I explained to you earlier, which is a calendar and cultural orientalism, which kind of tracks like a little bit from the theosophical movement at the turn of the century, the latter part of the 19th century, all the way up to like the beat to like the hippie movements, the American counterculture, right? Mm -hmm. um, and seeing how it like trickles even today's society. Yeah. So um, where it becomes this dynamic, this, this view, this gaze, G-A-Z-E, on how to understand um, how we understand the quote unquote East. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, if you ask any Asian that like, oh, well, is there such thing as an East? Well, first question is, where do you draw the line where East and West <laughs> like right. delineates? Then the second question is, is that like, you know, are these cultures, do they share a commonality? And it gets really complicated and really tricky. Mm -hmm. And the answer becomes lot more, much more convoluted. So, but there's this like idea of what we have, of what the East represents. Right. And that's what's complicated. Yes. Yeah. So. So, in your view, like as an um, anthropologist and as an acupuncture practitioner, um, is acupuncture, quote unquote, healthcare? Um, yeah, I see it as healthcare. It's an interesting intervention because, mm -hmm. like, from the from the position of the patient, it does a lot of good for people. Um, as I'm writing like my monograph now, I'm finding that the more you know about acupuncture. Mm -hmm the more you like don't know how it really works. The same know? could be said for yoga. Sure, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it's like I'm to a point where in July I will be practicing to some degree for 20 years, mm -hmm. you know, since I was 15 years old. And I find myself at this really interesting crossroads where it's like, okay, I learned basically the primary systems of thought, the traditions in America, mm -hmm. right, in the United States, but I really don't know how it works. You know, from that, from a biomedical perspective, that's one paradigm, we can get into that. Mm -hmm. But also from the paradigm of like, you have some theories are like one specific point treats X, Y, and Z. And then you have another system of thought was like, well, you treat what looks like that area on the opposite side, let's say like, this looks like a mouth, so you treat this because it looks like a mouth. <laughs> you know, so you have these various ideas and schools of thoughts and traditions. Right. And there's, it kind of debunks all your idea that there's just one Chinese medicine, right. there's just one acupuncture. Sure. You know, but I think what it shows and what's unique about 
something like yoga, meditation, acupuncture, Chinese medicine in general is this issue of like um, giving people space, mm -hmm. giving people the ability to be heard, mm -hmm. right? And that's what's kind of missing. I think that might be a missing link. Yeah. I have so many missing links. Yeah. You know, Especially in our, our modern society where everything is just go, go, go. Totally. We're stuck on our screens all day. We never yeah. give ourselves space or time totally. just to like reset. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, there's something to be said like this. One thing that I'm finding, especially with um, COVID-19 happening, is mm -hmm. that there's many various symptoms and there's many things that people don't know, right? There's asymptomatic people, then there's symptomatic people, and then people deal with this virus in many different ways. Right. So this in this illuminates the world of what is now called in the professions of medicine as a whole, um, individualized medicine, right? Mm -hmm. And individualized medicine is how acupuncture operates, how Chinese medicine operates. You're not doing this one kind of formula for everyone. You're kind of looking at a whole slew of things. People can call it holism, which we can get into that if you want. <laughs> but um, there's all these different um, elements to it that are in place. And it's with the understanding that people change, yeah. things change. You know, that's what makes it difficult for me that I'm finding as an acupuncturist for this long um, and doing herbs too, is that one thing might work for someone that has the same symptoms, but has like different presentation, then you gotta kind of tweak it. Know, for another person for another person mm -hmm. so that's sure. that's similar with like yoga meditation too very different though from like a western med med medical perspective where it's like these symptoms get this treatment sure yeah you're actually like addressing the person as a whole yeah 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 and that's one of the things i found out when i was researching helicobacter pylori in bhutan is that you had these patients at the biomedical hospitals that were getting the um, H. pylori eradication protocol, which is the gold standard, right? But still having symptoms, mm -hmm. even years down the line. But they're finding kind of treatment from it um, or alleviating the symptoms through traditional intervention. You know, so what's up with that? Yeah. And then, you know, one of the big arguments, if you're like, well, it's culturally embedded. That's the thing, is there's a lot of things that are culturally embedded in our way of doing medicine, right? For sure. So like when you're calling your doctor, you're already creating some cultural attitudes on the standard operating procedure that's accepted within your culture mm -hmm. on how to treat someone. Right. Right. Yeah. So sort of taking that idea of, you know, is acupuncture healthcare? And it's this ancient form of um, treatment. Can we apply that same train of thought to breathing techniques and yoga asana and stuff like that? Yeah. So this is kind of the experiment of like the 20th century for yoga asana, yoga asana because um, a lot of it, if y'all aren't familiar with like Mark Singleton's work and also especially um, Joseph Alter's work, who's a professor at Pitt, um, he's my colleague, um, especially Joe, who argued that physical culture was a huge, huge like um, frame of reference in creating what we know as contemporary yoga, mm -hmm. which is postural yoga, yo yoga asana, right? Right, that's, that's a really interesting point because if you research yoga at all, you start to realize that what we think of yoga as in the West, which is the postures and the breathing, you know, stuff like meditation, is really just the smallest speck on the radar totally. of yoga, you know, as a whole. Yeah. And the thing, yeah, I mean, if you if you find that yoga is without history, so I have believing that there's an ahistorical nature of yoga, you're gonna run into some issues. Cause like yoga has always changed. Like I said, I name dropped Yoga Chara school. Mm -hmm. They had nothing to do with like postures right. at all. Right. right. They argued that all things are mine. And that can get into like anything like this chair, which is called panpsychism, believing that all entities have consciousness. 
right? Mm -hmm. Like that's some deep stuff, you know, but even in Patanjali's Yoga Sutra, you know, the first lines is yoga is the cessation of the movements of the mind, mm -hmm. right? And how does that even go about? And there's all these slews of practices that um, are kind of goes into um, Patanjali's Yoga Sutra, but very, very little on asana, on right. postures. Right. Even in the sutras, there's very, very little mention of the postures. Themselves. No. That, yeah. And there's practices, but these practices are like, well, you know, so there's five dynamics of the mind of Chitta, mm -hmm. you know, um, some of them, the five turnings are, it's like, it, it's like wisdom or intellect, but also like error, you know, um, and um, uh, like uh, dreamlike thinking, illusionary thinking, you know, these are all elements where you're like, whoa, what? That's yeah. pretty wild. Like, yeah. it's some deep philosophy. Yeah, it's deep philosophy. <laughs> and that's the thing is that, and this is the big thing I'm writing in counterculture orientalism, mm -hmm. is that the focus is no longer these kind of abstract philosophical ideas, but they're these practices. Right which is really unique. I yeah. mean, the Beatles didn't go seek out TM, Transcendental Meditation, for the ideas. Mm -hmm. They came to seek it for the practices. You know, so this, there's this materiality, there's this material plane of existence right. that people are searching for. When did that start to happen, that shift? Oh, that's a big, that's a deeper question. And that's what- um, <laughs> Maybe that's too much for No, it's not. I, I mean, um, so, I think the first remnants of it in the United States, at least, mm -hmm. was with Madame Blavitsky and the Theosophical Movement. So the Theosophical Society of the United States or of America was the first kind of push. Now, I want to be really cautionary about the Theosophical Society because um, Madame Blavatsky was also a huge proponent of um, what is called Ariosophy, mm -hmm. which is this like, um, romanticization or romanticism of Aryans. Okay. You see where this is going? I do. Yes. And that is exactly the like trajectory of where that right. came about and deeply rooted into like, so for example, her big thing about Ariosophy was that Aryans came from Atlantis. Of course, <laughs> you know, um, and then not only that, that she got a lot of her um, wisdom from the Tibetan masters. Um, and somehow the Tibetan masters transitioned to, well, Indian, Himalayan Tibetan masters, what she called Mahatmas, okay. right? That gave her secret wisdom, mm -hmm. right? Um, and this is actually the first kind of instance where you see the translation of the word prana, right? And she didn't perceive it as breath. She believed that there's this like magnetic, magnetic sphere. Yeah. And that they, these Mahatmas, had these access to these magnetic spheres of existence. Interesting. So Mahatma is sort of like a great soul. Yeah, right? yeah, sacred yeah. soul. You know. Yeah. So like, what's unique about that is that was kind of the first the Theosophical Society, um, who actually uh, Doubleday, who got his first name, who was a some will argue as the founder of modern baseball, okay. was the president of the Theosophical Society when um, Madame Blavatsky and Olcott, um, Colonel Olcott, fled America because <laughs> they were outed by all these like Sanskritist and Pali Tech Society members. Um, I believe it's um, Coleman was the name. Were they sort of like frauds? Yeah, yeah. they were total frauds. Um, when, and this was in like the 20s? Turns, no, no, this was actually like late 19th. 19th century, so late 1800s, okay. right? There's, there's a trajectory to this, right? So what ends up happening is they go to India in 1885, mm -hmm. right? And they start on their new quest of proselytization of like what we now know as like new age, right? Um, into India, adult members and cohorts to that. And then um, in the latter part of Madame Blavatsky's life, um, settles in London and like that's where the Theosophical Society like kind of sort of like came and so died. Okay. Yeah, well, well, took off with this new ideas mm -hmm. and that like through those publishing houses started adopting all these translations of yogic texts. Interesting. Right? Mm -hmm. Because it's everyone kind of branched together and 
I guess you can say this is like the first time this kind of mysticism of the East, right? This kind of first, like, it's actually technically a second wave of Orientalism because before you that, you had like Chinoiserie and you know, all that stuff. But this is like the kind of interesting counterculture of Orientalism that comes. So this is like the first wave of a counterculture Orientalism that comes about. And that adopts like thinkers like Yogananda, right? So the autobiography of the yogi guy, right? Yeah. He comes in on the auspices of the American or Theosophical Society of America. And that starts launching into like getting this postural yoga in by the 30s. Yeah. Right? From so Yogananda, I think Vivekananda came up. Vivekananda, the same yeah. era. Yeah. Um, and probably one or two other really famous. Big movies. time, yeah. Big time um, yogen, um, Yogendra or. Um, anyways, there's all these different um, leaders in what we identify as yoga today. Right. And a lot of them came from Mysore. Mm -hmm. Right. So, um, and I guess you can trace most postural yoga. This is what Joe Joseph Alter writes and Mark Singleton writes um, that can be all traced to these Mysore schools mm -hmm. and specifically with man named Krishnacharya. Right who I some see. say is like the father of modern yoga. Yeah, yeah, and there's a lot of cred and um, there's a lot of backing to like legitimize that claim too. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, as yoga, we know, unless you go to India, because if you go to India, the kind of star of like yoga is uh, Swami Ramdev. Mm -hmm. Like he's on every billboard, he has, he's in, on like, in modern yoga. In modern yeah. yoga in India. Yeah. And um, he has very dodgy views on like, homosexuality and like he's you know there's some there's let's just say he's a very controversial figure yeah but he is like the rock star he's like Phil Stadium, oh so. yeah yeah I, the first time i experienced yoga in delhi was under a pranayam what he called pranayam mm -hmm. um or pranayama um workshop yeah at a cricket stadium yeah. it was completely like packed hundreds of thousands of people literally Hundreds of thousands of people just in Delhi. Yeah, it's pretty easy. and it's really cheap. It yeah. was like the equivalent to like two dollars mm -hmm. just to do these breathing techniques in simple postures. That's pretty cool. Yeah, that's pretty cool. <laughs> His political stuff, not so cool. Right. You know, like, yes. but um, it but with him gave rise to Hindu nationalism, right? Mm -hmm. But what you have with President Modi today, right? right? right. And the Hindu nationalist movement. Yeah. So there's which very, also pretty sketchy. Yeah, which is definitely pretty sketch, you know, <clears throat> where right, well, prior to COVID-19, there were riots because of the immigration laws of um, uh, disallowing Muslim Indians mm -hmm. or Muslim migrants to be Indian citizens. Right. 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 So there's that whole shtick, you mm -hmm. know, and so eloquently Modi has kind of shifted yoga into that saying this is our cultural heritage. Mm -hmm. But if you deconstruct, well, what is yoga? Then that's, that's a big question. Big question, right? <laughs> you know? Yes. So, yeah. um, but if you believe yoga is some ahistorical about history kind of thing, okay, sure, why mm -hmm. not? Yeah. But nothing's like that. Right. You know, so. And the people, I just spent six weeks in India and the people that I was studying with their, um, you know, the, there are these Vedic texts that go back thousands of years. Yeah. And like some of these books, you know, they're a couple thousand years old and they state that, you know, yoga has been going on since time immemorial. Like, sure. So who knows how long it's actually been. Yeah, around. and this is one of the things I teach in my um, classes. Like I teach Asian medical systems. We don't really, the big thing we teach is basically yoga, meditation, Ayurveda, Chinese medicine, Tibetan medicine. We're about to wrap up actually right now. Mm -hmm. um, but what I teach is that the term yoga in itself has constantly changed. Yes. And Sanskrit in general is a polysemic language, meaning that one word can mean a multitude of things. Even a simple term, dharma, right? Dharma can mean so many th things. It can mean a foundation of the house. It can mean the foundation of like your words, the structure of your words. It could be like law. But it could also be the Buddha's teachings, right? right? Or right. a teaching of some. So that's what I'm trying to get at is that when you're trying to like, even the the term chitta, right? Even it's, it's, mine. it's mine, but it could be consciousness. 
mm -hmm. could be thought, mm -hmm. could be like the processes of how your brain works. It's so many different things. So when you get in yoga, which could literally mean like the yoke of two oxen, mm -hmm. two agricultural animals, but also to bind, right? right? Um, two disparate objects, two mm -hmm. different objects, you know? Um, it could be like the physical reality to the abstract reality, that kind of reified process. Like mm -hmm. it's a multitude of things. Right. So but, depends on who's interpreting it. Yeah, and at this epoch in today's society, we interpret it as this postural thing. Right. Right? Right. So thousand years down the line could be completely something else. Sure. You know. So But it's interesting that, you know, as a concept. And like you say, they may, that may have changed over the millennia, but somehow it's still around. Yeah, something is still around. Yeah. Um, Maybe it's just the tiniest bit of. Yeah, the tiniest bit of iota. Maybe <laughs> this is. So this is where the like we can get into the well. I mean, this is where yoga charis would say, yeah, that's the mind, and that's what's transmigrated. Because mm -hmm. remember, like a lot of Buddhists are Buddhism is an anatman movement. I mean, they don't believe in the soul. They don't believe in a self, but they believe in a consciousness, right? Mm -hmm. So that can be what's spread around, right? Mm -hmm. And we have a consciousness, even like on a more simple level, right? Um, when you say America, right, or our founding fathers and what they fought for, right? People have an idea right. of what that may be. Right. And that kind of cheetah of America has transmigrated throughout time you know into mm -hmm. what we idealize it today right even it's a hit snippet of it yeah. right most of which we know from hamilton but yeah yeah <laughs> from hamilton of course <laughs> you know so this is the unique nuances of it and it can get really complicated but something is happening and mm -hmm. i'm not trying to disqualify of course I'm, I'm definitely not saying that yoga has no practicality sure because of what it has done to people is have people realize their own bodies. Yes. Right. Yeah. So getting back to that idea of creating space, yeah. creating creating a a moment where somebody can act, where somebody can process all the stress, yeah, all the whatever that's going on, and they can start to feel better. Yeah. Um, so is there is there a connection between something like Chinese medicine and acupuncture and yoga? Awesome. Well, it, it's really fascinating because, um, yeah, one of the things that I find is really unique. Mm -hmm. um, it, this is not so much so for yoga per se, because, like I said, the, yoga has a multitude of different like practices and stuff like that. But yeah. in Ayurvedic thought, right, there's the idea of doshas. Mm -hmm. right? Doshas has been really mistranslated. People think it means like humors. Well, not even the Greek people had the idea of humors. It's the French. It's so like 17th century, 15th, 17th century idea of thought, right? right. But um, but what doshas, the root of dosha is thus. Thus, since Sanskrit is an Indo-European language, thus is has a similar um, prefix, which is this. Like mm -hmm. in dystopia, dysentery, disease, you know, that's kind of, or disinfectant, that kind of stuff, yeah. right? Um, and literally, dosha means disease. It means fault. Mm -hmm. It means some kind of impurity. Some people even say sin, right? But that at base level is how they, they meaning Ayurvedic practitioners, see the body mm -hmm. because form is the first element of disease. Mm -hmm. Can't have disease without form, right? right? So um, in that aspect, what I'm understanding, and the same thing with Tibetan medicine, the three assemblages is called Nyepa Sum. Nyepa means same thing, fault, disease, whatever. Sum just means three, right? Mm -hmm. So you have this three, um, well, these assemblages of disease, and that's how you structure the body. Mm -hmm. What I'm trying to go with this is that, like, um, and uh, this will relate into trauma-informed care, too, is what I see, at least as a practitioner, I don't see health because I don't really know what health looks like at all. That makes a lot of sense. You know, but what I do see is disease. Mm -hmm. You know, I see the body inevitably, we're going to die. 
you know, and as practitioners of health medicine, we can just try to mitigate that kind of suffering for the inevitable, right? But the body is continually decaying and dying. Mm -hmm. um, Ayurvedic practitioners understood this. That just, got, just got really grim. Yeah, sorry. But um, this is also educate your on understanding of the nature of reality. For sure. Yeah. Right? And the nature of reality is all, at least in the Buddhist context, which Bhagavata, who wrote the Ashtangara Vidya Samhita, which is like the first Ayurvedic text that brought in doshas, right? Mm -hmm. he, he was the son of a Buddhist monk, right? So that got into this idea of the impermanent world and that well, what is the first noble truth in buddhism all things are suffering mm -hmm. right i'm sorry y'all if you get into buddhism it's not like it's not for happiness you know <laughs> the thing is to try to relieve suffering it's not all rainbows it's either. not all rainbows yeah. you know um so in this time of turmoil right now is not the worst time to practice it's actually the best time to practice and to understand what buddhists and um, Jains and Hindus all practice is karuna, which is compassion, mm -hmm. right? That's the one thing, one element that these kind of philosophies have together is to be there for each other yeah. and go beyond yourself to help other people, right? So um, in understanding disease as a healthcare, which your original question, yeah, it is, but that extends to many different things. I believe yoga is healthcare as well. Right. Um, and some will argue that, like, you know, if done correctly, there's very little, especially for chronic pain, because that's the thing with acupuncture is that in Chinese medicine, we are good at dealing with chronic pain, you know. Mm -hmm. So and, you know, bless all the doctors and nurses and healthcare practitioners that are combating the virus right now. Um, that's the first line of defense, you know. Afterwards, there needs to be triage, you know, um, and that's where we come in. And this is how we can help people deal with the suffering of their, of their bodies, with their lives, and etc. You know, so if anything, through the experience of yoga, is to give self care, mm -hmm. but also to help people in need. Yeah, you know, that's the overarching gap. Yeah. I like that idea of compassion that sort of runs through all these different philosophies. Totally, yeah. And the Buddhists have an interesting way of understanding compassion because they say since they're an Atma movement, they're a non-self movement, they're a non-soul movement, mm -hmm. the biggest embodiment of non-self or non-soul is compassion. Because you're going beyond yourself to help others, mm -hmm. no matter what the consequences are. You know? So all these people that are having things exist for ourselves to be in good health right now are risking it all right, right. literally for a better good for a greater good of mm -hmm. you know so that's definitely one thing out of all this which is really terrible and maybe and after hopefully after post covid 19 things will create or illuminate the world of compassion and selflessness yeah. That we're all capable of it. Yep. You know, especially in times of need and disaster. Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely something that I I hope for, like in the midst of all this crisis and everything that's going on, is somehow on the other side of it that there's a, a brighter future that we learn something out yeah. of this experience totally. as a as a collective, you know. Totally, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you know, there's all these elements that can get us there. Even taking a walk, even communicating with your friends, right? You know, yeah. any, even this kind of exchange. You know, um, we do what we can, but those things matter. You know, mm -hmm. um, but it also out of all this shows the fragility of the world. It really does, um, and how things just a little microscopic, unseeable thing can totally cripple economies, yeah, and societies, cultures, yep. Yeah. Force us to and how yeah. so many times we like we we were living our lives and we just believe that everything around us is like we've set everything in place and we're, we're exactly where we want to be yeah. and just one little thing can shake it just, up just change everything yep totally so to to live a life of compassion and to be of service starts to become 
more and more important. Yeah, you know? yeah. When you start to realize that everything around you is just temporary. Yeah, it's the nature of impermanence, right? Mm -hmm. It's a little bit expedited, expedited and normal right yeah. now. Yeah. But um, you know, hopefully, this things is what teaches us things is that we're in this together. Yep. I mean, it's spread it because we're together technically, <laughs> but we're all in it together too. Right. You know? <clears throat> um, as anthropologists, we look at things, especially like dynamics and patterns and weird things like viruses and see how they function, but also reflects on how like we as a society and culture shows our vulnerabilities, but how we also function as well. Mm -hmm. And what I've seen from all this experiences, though it's been horrible for a lot of people, is that it brings out a lot of good people too, yeah. you know? Um, and hopefully it lasts. And I yeah. think more so than ever, as we progress into it, the more thicker it is, the more we ought to like show. Come together and yeah. like find that sort of like. Yeah. Like maybe like raise the, the vibration. Yeah. As a race. Totally. Like, you know? Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. So, I mean, even when it comes to food now, right? Our relationship with food completely changes. Yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, you go in the supermarket now, you see how much things have changed, mm -hmm. you know? So, yeah, hopefully practices will change on that. Hopefully the compassion will rise from that. But, you know, we're in the thick of it, right? You know, well, in the Four Noble Truths of Buddhism, is that you gotta go and acknowledge that life is suffering. And then the question is that what is the nature of suffering? Then is that, yo, there's a way to stop this suffering. You know, it's a multitude of ways, but you ought to have like the right mindset, the right thought, right mm -hmm. action, right? right? That comes from all these healthcare workers doing their job, you know, saving people's lives. That yeah. Comes with like right insight, right thought, right intellect, right? Yeah. So, right view, you know, and then inevitably you will lead to the path that leads to the cessation of suffering. Mm -hmm. you know? So I think, you know, the, that formula that the Buddha had 2,000 something years ago, 2,500 years ago, has applicability today, right? It's a very logical, like, system, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, it's changes, it's very heterogeneous, but on a whole that, like, all things are permanent. Okay, yeah, I got that, right? You know, all things are suffering. Yeah, got that too, you know, with, like, um, and, you know, the, I mean, the third one, the three, third market of existence, all things are empty, you know, or, um, yeah, so that that's one of the things that is in the other element, is that, that the life we live, the substantive life that we create, the more we attach on to that material realm. And I don't mean, like, materialism, like, oh, I have a fancy car or whatever. Yeah, it extends to that. But our material existence, you know, and what we create and what we think as reality, has completely shifted yeah. with this. Yes. And that's what the Buddha teaches, that that material realm constantly switches, mm -hmm. you know, may sometimes longer than others, Yeah, but it's happening. Well, in yoga philosophy, there's a, a emphasis on non-attachment, I think. Yeah, it's a very yeah, similar yeah, thing. Totally, um, yeah. Because the more you get attached to the physical things around you, the more that they start controlling your life. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And uh, in, in, in Buddhism, there's the idea of Trishna, which means thirst. It's like the thirst of like, of you're in a desert and you're that thirsty, right? That kind of desire and attachment, mm -hmm. you know, it's applicable to our daily lives, yeah. you know, habits that we create. You know? So those kind of things are very present, even though it's written at least like 2000 years ago, mm -hmm. you know, those things are all applicable today. Right. You know, and how we understand the nature of our existence. Yep. You know, so, and especially dealing with health um, and medicine, you have to understand that the bodies are always changing, no matter as human bodies, like viral bodies, right? Mm -hmm. This goes with the impermanent, impermanent nature of all things, right? So, the best thing to do to that too is adapt with it and mm -hmm. be impermanent as it as those elements are as well. Yeah. You know. So taking that idea back to this sort of like yoga as therapy. Yeah. Yoga as we see it in the modern world. Yeah. You know. Um so 
in the circa like 1920s, 1930s, all these people, yoga yogis, came over from India. Yeah. And started sharing this new wave of yoga. Yeah. Which was much more focused on asana. Yeah. Um, and that's sort of like where our modern yoga world sits right now. It's like it's very focused on asana. Yeah. There's a little bit of meditation and mindfulness and there's a tiny bit of spirituality sprinkled in yeah um but because we're so focused on the actual postures asana is basically a posture and you know the pranayama the breathing techniques um how does that does that affect our health in a positive way yeah i mean Yes, it does. I mean, a lot of, uh, if, if y'all aren't familiar with um, Joseph Alter's work or Mark Singleton's work, they wrote extensively on this, that most of the asanas today are influenced by um, European gymnastics, right? Um, Fascinating. If not entirely, well, the corpus of contemporary asanas today, especially um, sun salutations was a complete um, adoption of like um, European so gymnastics. when the Europeans were sort of colonizing and well, it's, not invading, but like they, they were. So this is more or less like they already invaded. Yeah. Um, British colonialism, especially, yeah. was already there, right? Um, but as an anti-British, anti-colonial movement, these different elements of um, yogis or um, yoginis. Um, adopted these practices as to create um, the ideal body, hmm. right? This is where physical culture comes in. Physical culture now is called bodybuilding, right? But where physical culture comes in to understand the ideal aesthetic body, not only as a body of um, impurities, but of strength, and of strength to fight against British colonialism. Hmm. So that's the unique turn of all of this, right? Yeah. Is that their whole element is to say that we have these strong bodies, but to fight against British colonialism. Interesting. Right? So that's why it's really adopted, even in today's um, the narrative of Indian like nationalism. Right? Mm -hmm. That's the big element of it, right? Yeah. So these perfect bodies, these strong bodies, you know, are kind of the Templar. Mm -hmm. of what you see um, as this kind of like, not just as uh, of being healthy, but as a symbol mm -hmm. of resistance. Yeah. Right. And rewinding a little bit, as like, to my knowledge, asanas, which translates roughly into like a seat. It's a sit. Yeah. 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 Um, they were originally practiced in order to quiet the body so people could sit and focus the mind yeah so well, and really like get deep into like noticing the inner workings of the mind yeah yeah so that's an element like this goes to you know the first line of Tanjali's yoga sutra is that yoga is the cessation of the turnings of the mind mm -hmm. the workings of chitta right right whatever that is there's yeah. many different turnings there's five specific turnings um, Patanjali Yoga Sutra. And yeah, that's an element of it. Mm -hmm. What is yoga? The yoga in Patanjali's um, Yoga Sutra, right, is not postures at all. Right. So there's only four postures. They're all sitting down, mm -hmm. literally. Right. You know, um, but today, what we see is that, you know, it is when we're doing these, I guess you could say, exercises, right? Mm -hmm. They're calming the mind. Yeah. And specifically for the American mind, right that's constantly ruminating and doing all these workings mm -hmm. it helps you focus on oh man i'm in this crazy posture that kind of hurts right now you know <laughs> so it gets you back into your body right and also understand the nature of the mind right right or starts to at least. or starts to at least mm -hmm. so inadvertently it does what it it does what it does in the patanjali yoga sutra yeah but you know not explicitly yeah you know but the point of Patanjali Yoga Sutra is to be a good person. Mm -hmm. You know, here's the rule, here's the ways to being a good human being. Right, the yamas, the niyamas, yeah. it's all laid out there for you. Totally, yeah. yeah. 
And I, I mean, and that's the what, you know. So going back to like the 20s and 30s, right? Mm -hmm. um, the purpose of this was to create an ideal Indian body, mm -hmm. right? Because this was the height of nationalism, not just in India, throughout the world. Black people, Vietnamese people, we had our own like nationalism as well. Right? Yeah. Like, as Ho Chi Minh said, he's a nationalist first, communist second. Right. Japan, Japan, Germany, yeah. Germany yeah. China, you know. Yeah. So these are the elements that you see, this, this like growing wave mm -hmm. that also align with the human body, right? So that's why when I teach Asian medical systems, especially for like yoga, mm -hmm. um, the turn of the, or the 20th century, early part of 20th century is monumental in understanding not only bodies, but understanding national bodies. Interesting. Right? Yeah. No, we have that today. Like we have the aesthetic of what the American body is, though it's definitely changing, you know. Mm -hmm. But um, these elements are pervasive in our culture. We just don't really identify it yet, or as such, right? You know, right? Um, and it's that's masked by advertising. Yeah, and that's by advertising. Mm -hmm. Like you know, I, I mean, like, we're in the yoga environment, so like companies like to. Um, you know, push like yoga pants, but there's an aesthetic to that. Mm -hmm. There's a whole aesthetic. There's a body culture yep. involved with that as well. Yeah. You know, and the, the tradition y'all are um, in, um, it, it comes from BC Ghosh, right? And BC Ghosh, who for you, some of y'all don't know, is one of the first physical culturalists of in bodybuilders India. in India. In India. Yeah. Right. So, um, and he was a huge follower of um, Eugene Sandow. Um, and he was like the Eugene Sandow of India, right? Okay. So, and that kind of came along because a lot of these um, physical culture courses, training classes, were taught at YMCA's, mm -hmm. right? And the unique thing about YMCA's is the Y, the triangle and the Y, what does the triangle represent? Mind, body, spirit. Interesting. So like there's a whole history that's attached that into like, um, what we, some people identify as new age, but that kind of current, mm -hmm. right? Um, there's definitely an interesting, what I identify as orientalism involved with that, right? Yeah. It's not good or bad, it's unique, you know? Mm -hmm. And that uniqueness is really interesting to push these cultures forward, you know? Um, and it does, you know, doing yoga here, other places, it has immense effect, at least on my body, you mm -hmm. know? Um, but also, we should put the cautionary out there. If you do it incorrectly, you might hurt yourself as well. Right. You know, especially so, right now with like every yoga studio and gym everywhere going online. Yeah, it's really tricky because you're doing something without a teacher in the room watching yeah. you and taking care of you. Yeah. So yeah. that's the element that you know. I I personally like techniques mm -hmm. first and getting in techniques of each posture. Yeah. Um, these postures have, you know, our historical moment on these postures, these asanas, is that they create an arrangement of our body and stressors are of our body, but making us being aware of our body, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and I don't just mean like shavasana, but I mean like all the different postures. If anything, it teaches you this interesting kind of body awareness. Yeah. That you normally don't have. Yeah. You know? I there are a lot of different studies out there, but you know, a lot of a lot of people have focused on the effects of the mind that you, like yoga practice has on the mind. And um, you know, they found that it actually increases your neuroplasticity where you can actually like start to form new neural pathways just by practicing asana and you know focusing your breath yeah it's pretty amazing yeah and that's the big element that like for me i i i'm into breath right mm -hmm. and the whole element of breath right um even in the uh in the buddhist context like of um satipatthana sutra or the satipatthana sutta it's literally sati is what people have identified now as mindfulness right mm -hmm. but it literally means to recollect to remember it's the sanskrit word is smirti but in the Satipatthana Sutta, it teaches you to breathe in and telling your body, breathe in just like you're, well, this is you breathing in and exhale. This is your breath, exhale. 
that simple. But even that basic practice, you can call it meditation, you can call it whatever, hmm. that practice is forcing you to do the most basic voluntary, well, involuntary things, you know, all involuntary, voluntary things. Yeah. So, so that you can live. That's the interesting thing about breath. Yeah. It is involuntary. Yeah. We do it whether we think about it or not. But when we focus on it, it can really shift everything. Totally. Like when we really figure out how to control our breath, it's a game changer. Yeah. Yeah. And that is great. I mean, like, my son, the show is outside, but like Daniel Tiger, man, like he has one of the best meditations that I've seen. And it goes like this is when you feel so when you feel so down and you want to roar, take a deep breath and count to four. One, two, three, four. And that is the Sati Patana Sutra. That's some classic Mr. Rogers. I know, that's, that's some awesome. classic Mr. Rogers. And <laughs> like that in itself embodies just like, yo, remember to breathe. Yeah. Remember? And that I like that that kind of remembered. I like that better than mindfulness. This is like, yo, remember the most basic stuff that you have, mm -hmm. right? Um, and that actually is the, you know, Thomas Rod Davis, brief side note, Thomas Rod Davis, he's the founder of the Pali Tech Society. He's the first one to translate the word sati, the Pali word sati, which in Sanskrit is smirti, into mindfulness. Mm -hmm. right? Monier Williams, he translates smirti to mean recollect. But Thomas Rod Davis, for some reason, he translated it to mindfulness. When was that? That was um, the turn, well, turn of the 20th century, early um, or late 19th century. Okay. Yeah. So the idea of mindfulness is actually a very modern. Oh my concept. God. Yeah. 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 Completely. Interesting. Yeah. And if you look at like, if you look at any of the Buddhist practices around Asia, mm -hmm. what's one thing they have in common? They remember all the teachings. And they're reciting hours at a time all the teachings. Of the, the same Buddha. is true for India. Totally. Yeah. And that's the important part about the Vedas. Yeah. Right. Yeah. The Vedas, you need to listen and recollect. Right. And you, you recite Smirti. That's why Smirti becomes an important component of the Vedas. Mm -hmm. That's how it survived, mm -hmm. right? Because it's always it was passed by transmission, oral yep. transmission. It wasn't written down. Originally. It wasn't written down. Same with Pali. And Pali is really interesting because Pali has no written text. It's all phonetic. Mm -hmm. So there's Sinhala, which is Burmese um, Pali, there, or um, Sri Lankan Pali, there's Burmese Pali, there's Thai Pali, there's Devanagari Pali, and then there's English Pali, which is what most of the Pali text society writes. Mm -hmm. And it all adopts the language, the written language, mm -hmm. to transmit the so, I mean, that's actually how Buddhism spread so rampantly in the South Asia, right? Mm -hmm. Because of Pali. Yeah. Right? Um, and that's where it gets kind of messed up in the North Asia, where there's weird translations of, there's not as much cohesion. There's like Chinese translation of Mahayana texts. There's like um, Tibetan translations, um, not so much Indic translations um, that survived, but like, um, uh, and then China goes into Japan, etc. Mm -hmm. But that's the problem. Is Sanskrit is written through Devanagari. Pali, on the other hand, is phonetic. So it can attach to any language, right? Yeah. Yeah. So that's what's unique. And this is where going back to, to recollect rather than like mindfulness. I don't even know what mindfulness is. Because right. most of the mindfulness that we understand as mindfulness comes from um, John Kabat Zinn and is a mindfulness based stress reduction. And that protocol that's clinically based. You get what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So, like, if you're trying to understand that nuance of what mindfulness is, well, the big question is, what does it actually mean? Right. What does it mean to be mindful? Because according to John Kabat-Zinn, is just to allow thoughts to appear in your brain and not having any judgment to it. But that the point is to have discerning judgment to things, to do right action, right speech. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's very like and it's not opposition, but it doesn't align with a lot of Buddhist teaching, which John Kabat and got most of these practices. Yeah. What MBSR is based on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's the unique kind of element of it. Interesting. Yeah. Um, so you are really a big proponent proponent of breath and breath control. Um, 
the word pranayama, prana is breath, yeah. or sometimes it's trans translated as like, like life force, force yeah, um, energy, and then yama is sort of a like control. Yeah, retention control. Yeah. So in the Bhagavad Gita, uh, which is part of the Mahabharata, um, and uh, Patanjali's Yoga Sutra, they talk about pranayama, mm -hmm. but it's not. It's literally holding your breath or retaining your breath. Mm -hmm. in that context, mm -hmm. right? Um, what we see today in all these practices is very different, you know? Right. Um, but if you actually look through Patanjali's Yoga Sutra, um, that term, pranayama, or um, pranayaha, right? Um, it's interesting because um, it kind of illuminates that it's this retention of breath, mm -hmm. that things arise from that. Right. Yeah. The cessation of the turnings arise from the cessation of the breath. Mm -hmm. Right. Which is really unique. Yeah. You know. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it's. I mean, in the in the poly um, in the poly canon, there's there's a kind of contraindication that the Buddha talks about where you don't do any forceful breathing. You can cease all bodily functions. That's fine. But like for, forceful breathing is like no like. No bueno, mm -hmm. you know, no es bueno for them. Yeah. So that's the kind of unique element of it. But the point of the matter is, is that there is breath involved with all these things. Yeah. You know, um, and you I know, saw a really interesting translation once. Instead of like breath control, they were actually calling it like life force extension. Mm. So it was using your breath to actually elongate the span of your life or at least build more energy throughout your life totally yeah and there's a lot of validity to that you know yeah um yeah it, it's how you choose to live your life in a fulfilling manner because i see this very cautionary because i know a lot of qigong teachers and tai chi chuan teachers and they're all about breath control and stuff, but they smoke a lot of cigarettes. <laughs> you get what I'm saying? Yeah. And they end up dying really early. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, like, I'm, it's respect to yourself, and you respect yourself on breathing. Mm -hmm. Right? You do that every day. At the very least, I don't care what deity you worship, but you bet, you don't understand one thing. If you don't have air, oxygen, you're going to die. Mm -hmm. You know? So that's the key element that we're forced to live in this material reality. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there are some things that don't really change that much. No, no, no. So, I mean, but, but there again, you know, lies this kind of interesting issue of like, and why I brought up Madame Blavitsky is because she believed that prana was more than just breath. It was some magnetic force or et cetera, mm -hmm. right? In the ethers. Mm -hmm. I need to emphasize ethers, you know? Yes. So, but that kind of thing, in a way, got us to where we're at today understand okay wait a second like yo like she Madame Levitsky wasn't all there you know but what came out of that is these whole other different um what we call like heterogeneous kind of thought processes she helped to create the yes for or that. the impetus yeah the impetus yeah um whether if it was about to arrive or not um and what I argue in counterculture orientalism is that um these people through mostly white Americans came through cheap airfare, had access to these different ways of thinking, mm -hmm. you know. The biggest question that I'm at um, is this idea of enlightenment. You know, I don't, it's really hard for me to bow. Yeah. Because in America or in the West, quote unquote West, um, the hallmark of modernity is enlightenment. And that's through r rationality, empiricism, scientific method. Right? Mm -hmm. Like, that's by the way, when Nietzsche said God is dead, he doesn't mean that like God is dead. It means that like scientific rationality, modernity has overtaken truth, capital T truth from metaphysical belief, right? Mm -hmm. We're living in a weird world now where like it's the opposite. It's not opposite, but like there's, as an anthropologist, we already knew this. It's called relativism, you know, that there's no capital T truth. That's what we try to examine. What are the different truths that different cultures have? Right. 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 But you know, people will understand today philosophically as this is post-modernity, mm -hmm. where truth has be, become deconstructed. Yeah. Right. So. Um, well, even 
the small T truth. Yeah, even small question. question. No. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, because you once you know what to believe. Yeah. And you know, and it's fine. And it's totally fine. You know, when when like nothing has substantive belief, then it frees you up to everything. <laughs> you know, that's kind of what I'm at right now. Like as an anthropologist, like, you know, I I read RCTs, randomized control trials, and meta-analysis, and like, oh, this is gravy. Okay, P scale, which is the determinant of like the statistical um, uh, probability for a, a sound like clinical trial. But the P scale in itself is socially constructed, right? It's totally mm -hmm. created. Like yeah. 0.05. Who developed that number? Well, it was developed in the 18th century. Okay. Or 19th century, or I think an 18th century, but like someone just developed it. They determined 0 0.05 is like a sound, like clinical trial. Mm -hmm. You know, they forget that there's also the ethics committee, ethics board, um, IRB, in internal review board, institutional review board, right? These things are all socially constructed. Yeah. So that's kind of the, when I'm an anthropologist, it kind of leads these kind of problems, you know. Mm -hmm. But for me, I'm like, ah, these problems are great. Yeah. You know, it helps us problem solve, yeah. you know, and when, you know, when you're open to new ideas, it open and illuminates a whole different world for you, mm -hmm. you know. Um, I always find astrology interesting, you know, whether it's true or not, I don't really know. I don't really care, <laughs> but I find it really interesting. It is. It's you know? fascinating. It's really fascinating. Yeah. You know. There, I mean, astrology sort of originated around India as well, thousands of years ago. Totally. And there are my teacher that i was in india with was telling us the story about how there are these ancient astrological texts that somebody that knows how to navigate them can just by knowing you know how astrology works these days like your date of birth the yeah, time um, you were born yeah. a couple other things yeah. but if they read through these texts they can tell you pretty much your entire life yeah what's going to happen yeah so pretty accurately. Too. Yeah, this is, this is the thing about Vietnamese astrology, and this is like, this is our worlds in like East Asia and Southeast Asia. Like, in Vietnamese culture, like the day you're born, etc., is a, a huge determinant of your existence. Mm -hmm. Like, like that's why a lot of people were having kids in the year of pig last year. Yeah, because it was a golden pig. Very auspicious year. Very auspicious year, as we can see. <laughs> we're going now, but you know. Things aren't as auspicious, you know, but like this is the element that if no matter what people don't believe, yeah. it exists. Mm -hmm. And no matter like as much as you try to tell people it doesn't exist, the more value it has for other people for making it exist. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, you can say. Which I can mean, be said for any. For uh, anything. Philosophy. I mean, yeah. you know, Hegel called that dialectics. Right. Mm -hmm. So like those kind of oppositions and those kind of equilibration of those that of those oppositions are how things function, right? Yep. To go that far, you know? <laughs> so, um, yeah, I find all those things interesting and I'm kind of open to it because as, yeah. as an anthropologist and an acupuncturist, one thing that it taught me, those two things, is to listen to people. Mm -hmm. First and foremost, you listen to people, you hear what they got to say, how they interact with you. You know, that, that comes with, like, this direct electing of, who you are, you're just a piece of matter in this world, right? But to make something out of it, yeah. you interact with other people and other things, mm -hmm. you know, and make sense of your world at whatever sense you want to create it from it. You create it by interacting with different people and understanding different narratives. Yeah, so. absolutely. And it's such an interesting time to be in the world right now. And I think what you were saying about just being open and being curious and being compassionate, like all those different things will help us navigate the next couple months, the totally. next couple years. Yeah. Who knows how everything's going to turn out, but yeah. if we can just keep our center and breathe um, and, you know, be compassionate to others and be open. Yeah, totally. It's going to serve us. Yeah, moving forward. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what, what you know, what I told people is that what's most dangerous in this virus itself is the reaction to this virus, mm -hmm. the potential of the reaction to this virus. You know, if we can cultivate compassion 
understanding for each other and like calm down the animosity that we're in this together, yeah. you know, then that we can really you know, squelch a big fire that might be raging, mm -hmm. you know. So, and I hope we can all cultivate these kind of different ways. There's not just one single, but multiple ways of interacting yeah. in a more positive manner with the limits that we have. Yeah, you know? absolutely. Tyler, I think our time is up, yeah. but thank you so much. For yeah, being thank here. you, Deb. Yeah. Um, we covered a lot of ground today. Yes. <laughs> yes. So you can check out more yoga talks at yogafactory.com. Uh, and you know, keep in touch. If you have any questions for me or for Tyler, feel free to email us, info at yogafactory.com. And have an awesome rest of your evening. We'll see you again next week. Namaste.